given what I had discovered about this guy was going to be about what it is to be someone like him, what it is to be young, male, and poor in modern Morocco. Um, but through the process of writing, I mean, the book really turned out to be about um, belonging or identity, if you will. And I guess it's because for me, identity is not a simple, um, it's just not a simple concept. The original title for this book was called The Outsider, and it stayed like that for, you know, dozens of drafts. Um, and then one day, um, I went to a, a reading that Salman Rushdie was given, up for, given for the Enchantress of Florence when he was touring for the hardback last year. And I was getting my copy signed. He said, when's your new book coming out? And I said, well, it's coming out in, in, in the spring. And he said, what is it called? I said, it's called The Outsider, but you know, the publisher doesn't like it, so right now it's not called anything. And he said, well, you do realize that that title is taken. And I said, yes. And he said, that's like calling a book Heart of Darkness. So, so I realized, you know, I really do need to change the title. And that's how it became this sort of very simple, very descriptive um, secret I song. do. One of the things, one of my pet peeves is that if you are a, a, uh, an Arab or a Muslim writer in the U.S. and you have a book coming out, they will stick a veiled woman on the cover. And so when I, my first book came out, I said to the publisher, no camels, no sand, and no veiled woman. See, that is why one of the epigraphs to the book is the fact that I am writing to you in English already falsifies what I am trying to tell you. Because I don't want anybody to approach this book and to think, yay, it's written originally in English, you know, it's going to be my guide to Morocco, and, you know, and everything she says must be true. No, I have no pretensions of being you know, knowing any more about my country than anybody else. And so I'm just write, trying to write the best story that I can. One of, the, uh, one of the things that I particularly like about the book is I think there are no easy answers. That um, uh, Bart Chiamatti once wrote a book called The Play of Double Senses. And uh, it seems to me that this is a book that's full of double senses, that secrets can protect and secrets can endanger, that truth-telling can be advantageous but yet it can betray you um, that that there's that almost tragic sense that the, the characters can't escape their prior actions and I guess that um, the question is what what is it that so fascinates you about ambiguity just because that's how I view the world I don't look at it as something that is unambiguous and, and simple and so it's hard for me to write about characters who are like that or to write about situations who are like that. I but mean, I, of course ambiguity, I mean, just look half my life here, half my life there, all these, you know, languages percolating and different, different ways of looking at things, of course it's going to be uh, ambiguous. I guess one of the interesting things about being a writer is uh, putting yourself in other characters and trying to put yourself into other people's minds right. and, and, and so that's uh, so I wanted to know why it's not the secret daughter but why not the secret daughter I think it's because I, I feel uncomfortable writing about myself so I try to use sort of all these ways of n not making it about myself and so making it a man is one step in, in that direction and, and so yeah I mean I've written a lot of men characters. I enjoy it. <laughs> and also because nobody thinks, oh, you are this person. So it, it just makes it a little bit easier. I mean, there's only one chapter where there is a young woman who studies in America and everybody thinks I'm her. So can you imagine if, if the book was a woman, then it'd be like, are you the Jew? Oh yeah, exactly. So in fact, I got asked with the first book, did you ever, you know, is that how you immigrated? I've never been on a lifeboat in my life, you know, but that, that people really want to believe that that fiction has some sort of root in, in autobiography. Why a man, why a secret boy? I mean, what is it that you're trying to unravel with your story? What, what issues are you trying to basically address. focus on or address? Yeah. yeah. And I, when I started working on this book, it, I started with just an image of this young man. As I said, I didn't, I didn't have an agenda in mind that I was going to explore the taboo of illegitimate births in Morocco. In fact, Bill was telling me this, this amusing story where he read the book and gave it to a Moroccan friend and told him what the plot was about. And the Moroccan friend said, oh, it must be a true story. <laughs> um, but, uh, but, I mean, it, I didn't have that agenda in mind. And in fact, it's, it's really dangerous to start with, with a particular agenda of 
I am going to write a book in which I will explore the taboo of legitimate births. And I'm going to write a book in which, you know, it, it's, you start with the character. This is a story, it could happen anywhere. And so building from that and going through the emotions of what a young man who discovers that all of his life, everything you know about yourself is a lie. And looking at how he reacts when he hears those news, that is my work as the novelist, is to sort of explore that and explore those emotions. And then everything else that comes after that, all of the social issues, if you will, or the cultural issues or the political issues are sort of laid over on top of that later. But, but at the beginning, there is only that, that character and those human emotions. Consider writing the book in French, or do you always write in English? Um, um, when I went to college, I majored in English and started reading um, works of, uh, of either world literature, American literature, English literature, anything written in English. And, um, you know, and then when I left the country to, to do my master's and to do my PhD and return, and I would go back in the summer and I would see how much this relationship, this bilingualism that I had grown up with, which seemed normal to me when I was growing up. That just seemed how things were. You know, you use Arabic for one situation, you use French for another. You could be in one situation with one person using Arabic for one thing and using French for another. And you just code switch constantly. And it seemed, you know, natural to me because that was how I had grown up. But after I had left the country and kept coming back on vacation, that's when I, it just seemed bizarre to me that I would keep writing in French. And it was, you know, it just seemed impossible to me to rid the French language of the, that colonial overtone. Like every time I wrote in French, I felt like I was saying something judgmental about the characters. And I, you know, so English in a way, because on top of that, I was writing research articles in English and I was working on my dissertation in English. So English was starting to, I was starting to be immersed in it. It seemed a more neutral language for me to sort of write about um, my characters. And so that's how it started. Uh, Morocco has a very fascinating and rich heritage that is multicultural, that has, you know, Arab and Berber and Jewish and European. And do you, you know, capitalize on that rich heritage in, in, in your writings? Again, if you write a story truthfully, then you, of course, have characters who I mean, obviously, I speak Moroccan Arabic, but there are characters in this book who speak Berber. There are characters in this book who, who are Jewish. I mean, that is part of writing a realist book of fiction about Morocco. I, I want you. I want to ask you, as a writer, how does that affect the identity that you've been speaking about? Because I think there is a loss of identity as far as the Moroccan society, because there is really not much of, from, from a language perspective, there's a confusion in the language. But when you go back, you start seeing things that there is, there is a level of the lack of it. The kids are being taught in one language, but that language that they're being taught on is not practiced in a day-to-day, -day, whereas they move on to professionalism. They have to really practice you know, a different language that's not their mother tongue. So if you could touch a little bit about that from a sociological perspective in education, if you will, in, in the Moroccan society. You know, in Morocco, it's very different, right? because you learn one language at home, then you go to school and it's two other languages, and then later on in life you take another foreign language and on and on. And Yes, I mean, it does have the sense of not, I mean, there isn't a clear sense of there being one national language in which we are taught, in which we speak, in which, you know, everything is done in one national language. However, I mean, it is also one thing that makes us so, um, able to learn other languages, to be fluent, to be open to the rest of the world, to know where America is on a map, to know all of these things, is because we are exposed to all these other languages when we are young, you know? And so to me that is, yes, it does, there, it might give rise to all these sort of confusions, but on the other hand, it's also extremely enriching. So. But thank you very much for coming. You've been a great audience. Thanks. of uh, Morocco that I've been to a number of times.
times, and so um, I've been looking for, for some works by a uh, great rock and writer. I'm sure Leila did um, a wonderful job, uh, you know, describing uh, our culture and giving great insights uh, about Morocco. Like she said, it's not all about camels and, and sand, and, and I'm, ha I'm really happy about that. And I'm happy to see more writers, Moroccan writers, emerging Moroccan writers, coming to the spotlight.